This talk is the first of two talks about the ulnar nerve. It is intended for the Neurophysiology Fellows at Niklaus Children's Hospital. This talk will be conducted in a question and answer format. The first question is, the ulnar nerve arises from the medial cord. A true, B false. The brachial plexus can be divided in three regions. The cord is taken as the boundary. Above it is the proximal region, below it is the distal region, and the cords are the middle region. Six nerves arise from the proximal region. Seven from the middle region. The medial nerve of the forearm is the last branch that arises from the medial cord prior to the formation of the ulnar nerve. The distal region gives out five nerves, two posterior, the axillary nerve, and the radial nerve, and three anterior. The origin of the three anterior nerves resembles an M. The most medial leg is the ulnar nerve. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The lateral horn is usually present at the C8 level. A true, B false. This is a representation of the spinal cord with the vertebral body removed. Were we to cut at the place indicated, that is at the level of C8 spinal bundles, spinal nerve, and spinal cord, as I am presenting in this frame, and then look at the transverse cut, we would see the spinal cord the ventral and dorsal roots and the spinal nerves. In the dorsal roots, close to the formation of the spinal nerve, we would see the spinal ganglia, which houses the sensory neurons. If instead of cutting at the level of C8, we cut at the level of T1 and do the same procedure, that is, we look where we cut, we would see a slightly different picture. We would see the anterior horn the posterior horn, but also we will see the lateral horn. And were we to use a special stain, we would see sympathetic motor neurons in the lateral horn and sympathetic fibers intermingling with the ventral horn, rootlets, and root. The sympathetic neurons conglomerate at this level in the lateral horn, and they are called the nucleus of Budge. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. The sensory and motor fibers of the ulnar nerve enter the spine through the same spinal nerves. A true, B false. I will address this question from three different perspectives using three different basic figures. The first figure, I call the line figure, is what you're seeing in this frame. In this figure, the cylinder represents the spinal cord, the white ovals, the dorsal ganglion, at their corresponding levels. Notice that the ulnar motor fibers arise from C8 and T1, whereas the ulnar cutaneous sensory fibers 
arise only from C8 dorsal ganglia. The next figure, which I hope will provide you with a different perspective, consists of an anterior view of the brachial plexus. As indicated, the motor fibers arise from C8 and T1, travel through the ventral rami of C8 and T1, then the lower trunk and the medial cord. The sensory fibers arising from the C8 dorsal ganglion travel through the ventral ramus of C8, then lower trunk and medial cord before they reach the ulnar nerve. The third figure I would like to bring in in order to give you a different perspective of this very important question is one that emphasizes the anterior horn of the spinal cord. In this frame, you can see the lateral transection of the cord and the corresponding dorsal ganglia. Now I have colored the location of the motor cells contributing to the formation of the ulnar motor nerve. As you can see, it involves the C8 and T1 spinal segments. Although some authors have described that motor neurons for the ulnar nerve are as high as C7, this contribution is not agreed by most of the authors regarding anatomy of the ulnar nerve. So most authors believe that the ulnar nerve motor neurons are restricted to C8 and T1 spinal segments. The dorsal ganglia involved with the ulnar nerve is the one corresponding to the C8 cervical segment. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. The most vulnerable segment of the ulnar nerve is at the elbow. A true, B false. The ulnar nerve can be divided in four segments. Here, I will just mention them, and later, in the course of the answering other questions, we will hear more about them. The first segment is called the proximal segment. The proximal segment consists of the shoulder and proximal arm. In this segment, the ulnar nerve travels in the medial branchial fascial compartment. The second segment is referred to as the elbow segment. It is dominated by the epicondyle olecranon ligament. The elbow segment is the most vulnerable region of the ulnar nerve. The third segment is referred to as the forearm segment. In this segment, we will emphasize the relation between the ulnar nerve and the different muscles. And the fourth segment is the wrist and the hand segment. The main structure in this segment is the Guyon's canal. So the answer to this question is a. True. Next question. In the upper arm, the ulnar nerve travels in the medial fascicle compartment. A. True. B. False. As the motor and sensory fibers that will form the ulnar nerve exit the median cord, they enter the axillary sheath. The axillary sheath distally forms the compartment to which we have previously alluded, named the medial branchial fascial compartment. In it, we find, in addition to the ulnar nerve, the median nerve. This location is the closest these two nerves ever are, so in the presence of common pathology, this is the place to look for it, as well as in the wrist because of the high frequency of lesion in that area. 
outside the medial brachial fascial compartment but at the same level we can find the musculocutaneous nerve and the radial nerve the muscles in this area are labeled in this frame it is important to remember that at this level the coracobrachialis is close to the ulnar and the median nerve so the answer to this question is true a next question which of the following structures is most distal a the arcade of extruder b the medial epicondyle c the cubital retinaculum d the arcade of osborne in this frame you can see a cartoon that i have used before i'm placing it here to show you the different segments of the ulnar nerve and now if you turn your attention to the other side you can see a drawing showing the relation between the nerves of the forearm and the bones of the elbow as you can see this view is from the front the arrow is now pointing to the medial intramuscular septum this septum divides the arm muscles in two groups those in the front are flexor those behind are extensors I have now introduced a new figure this is viewing from the medial side again I'm showing you the medial intramuscular septum and I will introduce the arcade of extruders which is defined as a thin aponeurotic band extending from the medial head of the tricep to the medial intermuscular septum yet in this world research paper the conclusion is that the term arcade of a studer is historically incorrect because the structure carrying this name was not mentioned in the original report by Dr. Studers yet the term is still in use and we will continue using it now the new arrow is pointing to the medial epicondyle region now to the cubital retinaculum which I have in the past referred to as the epicondyle olecranum ligament now the arrow is pointing to the arcade of Osborne the two arrows point to the humeral and ulnar heads of the flexor carpi lunaris these nerves are the branches going for their innervation notice that in this figure they arise before and are above the arcade of Osborne this is not always the case and at times they arise from within the arcade of Osborne the new arrow is pointing to the branch of the flexor digitarum profundus for the fourth and fifth fingers the last structure I want to show you in this figure is the main trunk of the ulnar nerve as it travels to the hand in this new figure corresponding to a more superficial dissection plane of the medial elbow again you can see the medial intramuscular septum which serves as a landmark to recognize other structures the arcade of extruders the little branch may be perce perceptible in the video corresponds to the articular branch of the ulnar the arrow now points to the cubital tunnel retinaculum 
This structure is also called the epicondyle olecranon ligament. Distal to the cubital tunnel retinaculum, we find a fascia between the heads of the flexor carpi ulnari called the osporum fa fascia. We can also see the motor branch of the flexor carpi ulnaris here represented under the fascia. We can also point to the ulnar nerve traveling distally. And the arrow now indicates the flexor pronator mass. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. A section of the floor of the cubital canal is formed by the medial ligament of the elbow and by the flexor digitorum profundus. A true, B false. In this frame, you can see the two heads of the flexor carpi unaris. They are being separated. Now you can see the flexor pronator group being indicated by the arrows. Now the median intramuscular septum, the bicep, brachialis, and triceps. Now you can see the deep flexor pronator aponeurosis and the belly of the flexor digitarum profundus. Other structures worth mentioning in this frame are the arcade of struthers, the medial epicondyle, the ulnar groove, and the cubital tunnel retinaculum. Notice the introduction of the arrow. The arrow is going through the cubital tunnel. Were we to cut the cubital tunnel retinaculum as we have done in this frame, we would find at the bottom the medial ligament of the elbow and the flexor digitarum profundus. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The boundaries of the ulnar groove consist of the common flexor tendon, the olecranon, the cubital tunnel retinaculum, and the medial epicondyle. A true, B false. This is a transverse cut at the level of the tip of the olecranon. You can see the ulnar nerve, the cubital tunnel retinaculum, the common flexor tendon, the medial epicondyle, and the olecranon process. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The arcade of a struder and the ligament of a struder refers to the same anatomical structure. A true, B false. The arrow indicates the arcade of a struder, of which we have been talking about. This frame shows a humerus in three colored structures the brachial artery, the median nerve, and the ulnar nerve. The arrow points to a prolongation of the bone called the supracondylar process. In this frame, the arrow indicates the medial epicondyle. The structure between them is called the ligament of struders. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. At the level of the epicondyle groove, the ulnar nerve fibers destined 
to innervate the skin of the dorsal aspect of the hand are in the inferior lateral region of the nerve. A true, B false. You have seen this drawing before. The arrow indicates the site of interest, which I am now enlarging by a circle and colored the more internal region in blue is occupied by fibers destined to innervate the flexor carpi ulnaris and the flexor digitorum profundus. The more external and ventral region of the nerve with the arm in physiologic position is occupied by the terminal motor and sensory branches for the hand except for the dorsal cutaneous nerve that travels lower and medially in the nerve. You can see that area here colored in yellow. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The dorsal cutaneous fibers in some individuals exit the ulnar nerve in the arm and do not go through the ulnar groove. A true, B false. Dorsal cutaneous fibers at times exit the ulnar nerve in the arm and do not travel through the ulnar groove. Hence, these fibers may be spared in patients with elbow ulnar nerve lesion. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The first dorsal interosseus is the most vulnerable muscle in external elbow compression. A true, B false. This is the same figure as you saw when I was answering the last question. I have now color red the most vulnerable ulnar nerve region at the elbow. This region corresponds to the dorsal cutaneous fibers but also in this area we find the fibers for the first dorsal interosseus. Fibers for the hypothenar muscles are not in the most vulnerable area of the ulnar nerve at the elbow. The fibers for the lumbricals are also not in the most vulnerable area, but with severe injury, they all may get involved. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Which is the first muscle innervated by the ulnar nerve? A. Flexor digitorum profundus B. Flexor carpi ulnaris. C. Flexor digitorum superficialis. D. Palmaris longus. The first motor branch of the ulnar nerve, indicated here by the arrow, is the branch for the flexor carpi ulnaris. The flexor carpi ulnaris originates from the medial epicondyle in the olecranon process. It inserts at the piriform, the amate, and at the base of the fifth metacarpal. Its action are flexion of the wrist and adduction of the wrist. It is tested by performing the procedure indicated in this drawing. The arrows indicate the direction of the forces resulting from the patient's effort. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Which of the following muscles is innervated by the ulnar nerve? A. The anconius epitrochlearis. B. The flexor carpi radialis longus. C. The flexor digitorum superficialis. D. Palmaris longus. The anconius epitrochalis is an accessory muscle at the medial aspect of the elbow. It is also known 
as the accessory anconius muscle and should not be confused with the anconius muscle which is present in the lateral aspect of the elbow. The anconius epitrochalis is innervated by the ulna nerve. Here is a cartoonish representation of this muscle. You can see its relation to the medial epicondyle and to the olecranum. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The Osborne ligament is named after an Italian physician. A true, B false. A nice article about the history of this ligament was published in 2017. The photo of Dr. Osborne shown in this frame was taken in late 1970. Dr. Osborne was born in North Wales. The so-called Osborne ligament has also been referred to as the arcuate ligament of Osborne, the cubital tunnel retinaculum, Osborne fascia, Osborne band, or simply the arcuate ligament or tendinous arch. I have looked at several photographs with a structure labeled as Osborne ligament that look quite different from each other. It seems to me that Osborne ligament has been given many names and many structures have been given the title of Osborne ligament. The Oxford reference defines Osborne ligament as a tendinous arch formed by the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris under which the ulnar nerve passes. What I find interesting about this ligament is the way it has been linked to the anconius epitrochalis muscle. The ligament has been considered differently by different authors. It has been considered a remanence of the anconius epitrochalis, an evolutionary improvement to the anconius epitrochalis, and just a replacement for the anconius epitrochalis. Stop the video and take a few seconds to look at the dissection on your right. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. Which of the following muscles do not abut with the ulnar nerve? A. Flexor digitorum profundus. B. Flexor carpi ulnaris. C. Flexor digitorum superficialis. D. Palmaris longus. The forearm can be divided in three regions. I will first address the upper region. This is a cut through the upper third of the forearm. You can see the ulnar nerve, the flexor carpi ulnaris embracing the ulnar nerve, and just dorsal to it, the flexor digitorum profundus. At this level, the flexor digitorum profundus is not at abutting with the ulnar nerve. At the middle region, a cut will show the ulnar nerve now surrounded by the flexor digitorum superficialis, the flexor carpi ulnaris, and the flexor digitorum profundus. At the most distal region, we find the ulnar nerve sandwiched between the flexor carpi ulnaris and the flexor digitarum profundus. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Flexor retinaculum transverse carpal ligament is the floor of the Guggen's canal. A true, B false. The course of the ulnar nerve in the wrist is dominated by the Guggen's canal. In this view, you can see the flexor retinaculum of the wrist or transverse carpal ligament. 
cutting at the level of the line, we can see the Guyon's Canal and the Carpal Tunnel. Inside Guyon's Canal, we find the ulnar vein, nerve, and artery. One of the walls of Guyon's Canal at this level is the pisiform. The roof is the palmar or volar carpal ligament. Now I will bring a new figure to show you another perspective of this region and especially of the Guyon's Canal. I will start by pointing out the palmar carpal ligament here cut. Next, take notice of the hamate and the pisiform bones, and that between them there is another ligament called the pisohamate ligament. As you can see, both the palmar carpal ligament and the pisohamate ligament share the pisiform bone, but then they split. The palmar carpal ligament fades into the transcarpal or transverse carpal ligament. The piso hamate ligament goes from the pisiform to the hamate. These two ligaments constitute the roof of Guyon's canal. Also, notice in this diagram that the superficial and deep ulnar branches are labeled not because being superficial or deep to the roof of the, the Guyon's Canal. They both go through the Guyon's Canal. They are called superficial or deep in relation to their position with the hypothenar muscles, especially with the hypothenar muscle tendon. The superficial branch goes above it, the deep branch goes below it. So going back to the transverse look of the carpal tunnel, we will continue labeling the region. And we will start by pointing out the flexor retinaculum of the wrist or the transverse carpal ligament that we have already mentioned. And the little hole that you see on the other side, which is the, the for the flexor carpi radialis. So the answer to this question is A. Next question, which sensory fibers exit the ulnar nerve after Guyon's canal? A. Dorsal cutaneous branch, B. Palmar cutaneous branch, D. Superficial branch, D. Elbow articular branch. Here you can see the ulnar nerve. This branch is called the dorsal branch. The dorsal branch innervates the skin of the dorsal part of the hand as shown in this picture. The palmar branch, which innervate just the proximal region of the palm on the ulnar side of the hand, and the superficial branch that goes for the rest of the ulnar palmar region, the fifth finger and the ulnar side of the fourth finger, all the way to the tips. This branch also goes for a muscle. The muscle is called the palmaris brevis. So the answer to this question is C. Next question, which of the following is the last palmar branch of the ulnar nerve? A. Abductor deity minini, B. Adductor pollicis, C. Fourth lumbricals, D. First dorsal 
interossei. This is a drawing of the wrist and hand. You can see the roof of Cujun's canal, the hypothenar muscle tendons, and the abductor pollicis tendon that goes between the oblique and transverse head of the adductor pollicis. Now I have cleared these labels to reintroduce the ulnar nerve with the dorsal, palmar, and superficial branches. As you can recall, the superficial branch, in addition to cutaneous sensory fibers, carry fibers for the palmaris brevis. Now in red, I have introduced the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. The number one twigs that comes out of this branch corresponds to the abductor deity minini. The number two strand from the deep branch of the ulnar nerve are the fibers for all other hypothenar muscles, which includes the opponent and the flexor digiti minimi. Number three stands for the adductor policies. The fibers for the adductor policies can be considered the last branch of the ulnar nerve. Number four it stands for all other ulnar muscles. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Which of the following muscles is not innervated by the ulnar nerve? A. Flexor digiti quinti. B. Adductor policies. C. Flexor policies brevis superficial head. D. Palmar interossei. In this figure, you can see all ulnar innervated muscles of the hand. But in case of the flexor policies brevis, the ulnar nerve only innervates the deep head of this muscle. The superficial head is innervated by the median nerve. Here in this frame, I have illustrated this point. So the answer to this question is C. Flexor policies brevis. Superficial head. Next question. What muscle does this? A. Flexor digiti quinti, B. Adductor digiti minimi, C. Palmaris brevis, D. Palmar interossei. In this figure you can see the ulnar nerve innervated muscles of the hand. The arrow is pointing to the palmaris brevis. The palmaris brevis originates at the tendinous fasciculi from the transverse carpal ligament and palmar aponeurosis. It inserts on the skin of the ulnar border of the palm of the hand and occasionally on the pisiform. Its action is to fold the skin of the hypothenar eminence transversely by pulling on the skin over the hypothenar eminence. This pulling deepens the cup of the palm of the hand and so improves the grip. The action of the palmaris is reflected in these few frames. Here we find the palmaris at rest, here during action, and here even more action. The production of these creases brought about by 
abduction of the fifth finger is called the moving filler sign. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. What muscle is affected? A. Flexor deity quinti. B. Adductor deity minimi. C. Third palmar interosseus. D. Fourth dorsal interosseus. This is a photograph of Dr. Noble David. He was the first person who mentioned the Wartenberg sign to me when I was a fellow at the University of Miami. The position of this sign consists of extension and abduction of the fifth digit. This position is due to the unopposed action of the extensor deity minimi. This muscle is innervated by the radial nerve and in addition to extending the little finger, it abducts it when unopposed by the ulnar innervated muscles. The deficit, as you can imagine, is due to ulnar innervated muscle, mainly due to adduction weakness. This occurs because the third palmar interosseus, according to some, these symptoms only occurs when there is an imbalance between the third palmar interosseus and the abductor deity minini favoring the later. Most physicians, though, believe that Wartenberg sign lacks localization value within the ulnar nerve. So remember, Wartenberg sign indicates weakness of the third palmar interosseus, which usually occurs in conjunction with all ulnar innervated muscles of the hand due to the autopause action of the extensor deity minimi, which is innervated by the radial nerve. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. The third palmar interos interosseus behave like the abductor deity quinti. A true, B false. We have all read the book or seen the movie The Three Musketeers. So you know that there are four are not three musketeers. So when talking about hypothenar muscles, we have more or less the same situation. The three musketeers of the hypothenar region are the abductor deity quinti, the flexor deity quinti, and the opponent deity quinti. But as in the story, there is a fourth musketeer the question is, which muscle is it? The fourth musketeer is the third palmar interosseus. Remember, there are three palmar interossei. As you can see in this frame, and none of them touches the third finger. The palmar interossei originate from the shaft of the second, fourth, and fifth metacarpal palmar surface, inserting at the base of the proximal phalanx to the extension and expansion of the second, fourth, and fifth fingers. The action of the palmar interossei is to adduct the second, fourth, and fifth finger at the metacarpal phalangeal joint and assist the lumbricals in their fingers action. The third palmar interosseus is tested by pushing the little finger towards the ulnar side and the patient pushing against it, as you can see in this picture. The second palmar interosseus is tested by pushing the index finger towards the thumb while the patient pushes the finger in the opposite direction as you can see in this frame. So do not forget that the third palmar interosseus 
is the fourth musketeer of the little finger? So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Which of the following maneuvers checks the first palmar interosseus? Please take a look at the different maneuvers and decide whether it's A, B, C, or D. The classic pneumotechnic rule to remember the action of the interossei is tab for the dorsal interossei because dorsal abducts the fingers and pad for palmar interossei because palmar adduct the fingers. Hence, this pneumotechnic rule that pad or pad that is the one most often used. I think it is much better just to look at the dorsum of the hand in full abduction and notice that the fingers are dorsally deviated when doing so and when making a fist you bring them towards the palm an action that actually adducts the fingers. The first palmar interosseus is checked as you can see in this picture. In children, the easiest way is to ask them to cross their fingers. And usually what they do is to move the index fingers cross the third finger. This is the way that you can actually test the first dorsal interosseus, which is by putting your finger on the side of the thumb and asking them to push against your finger. So the answer to this question is A. Next question, which of the following muscle is being tested? A, flexor digiti quinti, B, opponents digiti quinti, C, third palmar interosseus, D, flexor digitorum profundus. Resistance by the examiner to the effort of the patient to bend the last phalange of the little finger test the flexor digitorum profundus, going to the fifth finger. The flexor digitorum profundus originates from the middle of the anterior ulnar bone and interosseous membrane. It inserts at the base of the distal phalanges of the fourth and the fifth fingers. Their primary action is flexion of the distal phalanges of the fourth and fifth fingers and the secondary action is to assist flexion of the wrist. So the answer to this question is D. Next question, which muscle weakness leads to from its sign? A. Flexor digiti quinti. B. Adductor policies. C. Third palmar interosseus. D. Flexor digitorum profundus. From its sign refers to the flexion of the distal phalange of the thumb when attempting to hold paper between the thumb and the index finger. This abnormal position arises from compensatory contraction of the flexor pollicis longus, a medial nerve innervated muscle. The deficit is expressed by failure to maintain a paper between the thumb and the index finger. It is due to weakness of the adductor policies. This finding indicates an ulnar nerve deficit but does not localize a lesion to any ulnar nerve segment specifically. So in this cartoon we can see 
represented from it sign which primarily reflect weakness of the adductor policies. The adductor policies originate from the anterior shaft of the third metacarpal, from the base of the second and third metacarpals, and also from the capitate, trapezoid, and trapezium. Insertion is at the base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb. Its function is adduction of the thumb at the carpal metacarpal joint. The adductor policies is tested by feeling the force when the patient is attempting to adduct the thumb as you can see in this figure. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. All of the following are signs present in the typical claw hand in ulnar nerve palsy except A. Hyperextension of the MP joints of 4 and 5 finger. B. Flexion of the interphalangeal joints of 4 and 5 finger. C. Hyperextension of the MP joint of the thumb. D. Tingling sensation in the hypothenar region. This is a representation of a claw hand due to ulnar nerve lesion. We find hyperextension of the MP joint of the fourth and fifth fingers, flexion of the interphalangeal joints of the fourth and fifth fingers, and hyperextension of the thumb metacarpal phalangeal joint, which is called the sign of GN. The combination of these three findings produces, when looked at looking at the hand from the palmar side, the benediction hand. Tingling sensation in the shaded distribution is often present in patients with ulnar nerve lesion, but is not considered part of the ulna claw hand. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Which of the following abnormal positions is more likely to indicate an ulna lesion at the elbow? Please take a look at this frame and decide whether it's A, B, C, or D. The typical posture due to ulnar elbow lesion at the elbow is called the benediction hand, as you can recall. This fresco demonstrates well the hand position and the reason to call it the benediction hand. The drawing is perfect for it except that the thumb is not abducted as it is usually in the case of ulnar lesions at the elbow. Four characteristic hand postures are shown in this frame. The ape hand due to loss of thinner muscle mass due to median nerve injury. The ulnar claw hand. Wrist drop due to radial nerve injury. And a complete claw hand due to brachial plexus lower trunk lesion. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. In pisohamate hiatus syndrome, the abductor DGT quinti is spared. A true, B false. The pisohamate hiatus syndrome is also called Goujon 2A or syndrome of the tendinous arch of the hypothenar muscle. This figure shows structures related to the ulnar nerve injury involved at the wrist. I have introduced these structures before, but I will do again so we can recall them. The roof of Guyon's canal, 
the hypothenar muscle tendon and the adductor pollicis tendon. This figure I hope you are also familiar with, as you recall the dorsal and the palmar branches exit the ulnar nerve before the ulnar nerve reaches the wrist, thus are spared with lesions in this area. Other branches of the ulnar nerve depart from it after crossing the wrist. Here I have indicated the superficial branch that goes for the fingers with a little branch for the palmar palmaris gravis and also leaving after crossing the wrist is the deep branch of the ulnar nerve which I have color red. As you recall the first branch goes for the abductor digiti minimi, the second branch goes for the other hypothenar muscles. The number three indicates the last branch of the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. This is the branch that goes for the adductor policies. The number four stands for all other ulnar innervated muscles not previously considered. In patients with Guillain 2A or Pisohamate syndrome, the injury occurs while the deep branch of the nerve is still in the canal. corresponding to the area I have enlarged, producing weakness in all hand ulnar innervated muscle except the palmaris brevis, the abductor digiti minimi, and all other hypothenar muscles. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Which of the following maneuvers check the first dorsal interosseus? A, B, C, or D? The ulnar hand innervated muscles are listed in this frame. Among them are the dorsal interosseae. The dorsal interosseae originate from the adjacent dorsal surface of the metacarpal bones, inserting at the base of the proximal phalanx to the extension of the second, third, and fourth fingers. I remember that two interosei insert in the middle finger because the word middle has two D's. Their actions are abduction of the second, fourth fingers and abduction and adduction of the third finger are the MP joints. This drawing that you saw before for palmar interosei obviously also works for dorsal interosei. But still, I like the logic of the finger deviation when using the dorsal interosei, the tip of the fingers goes dorsally as you can see in this frame. And that to me is easier to remember that the dorsal interosei abduct the fingers. In addition to abduction of the second and fourth and also abduction and adduction of the third finger at the MP joints, the dorsal interosei assist the lumbricals. Now I like to tell you a few things particular to the first dorsal interosseus. The first dorsal interosseus 
attaches to the ulnar side of the first metacarpal and to the radial side of the second metacarpal. And its insertion is at the base of the second finger. Its main action is abduction of the index finger as it can be deduced from its attachments. This action is tested by asking the patient to abduct the finger against resistance, as you can see in this figure. In addition, the first dorsal interosseus flexes the MP joint and extends the index fingers at the proximal and distal interphalangeal joints, thus helps the lumbricals of the index finger. So the answer to this question is, B. Next question. The first dorsal interosseus will be involved in all the following lesions except A. Guyon 1, B. Guyon 2, C. Guyon 2A, D. Guyon 3. This stamp was created in honor of Dr. Guyon. He described the tunnel that now has his name. If you are interested, you can read the article. It is a very good article and goes deeper into the anatomy of the area that bear his name. In Guyon type 1, the lesion is inside the Guyon's canal, involving the deep and superficial branches of the ulnar nerve. Hence, the sensation of the distal palm area and the palmar region of the ulnar half of the fourth finger and the palmar region of the fifth finger will be compromised, but the part of the skin of the hand innervated by the palmar and the dorsal branches that exit the ulnar nerve before entering the wrist will be normal. Muscle-wise, all the hand innervated muscles by the ulnar nerve will be affected. Hence, the palmaris brevis will be affected. The abductor digiti minimi will be affected. And so will be affected the two other hypothenar muscles, the flexor digiti minimi and the opponent digiti minimi. In addition, we will also have weakness of the adductor policies and all other ulnar innervated hand muscles, as we previously mentioned. In this frame, I have removed the ceiling of the Guyon's canal to better appreciate the location of the lesion. In Guyon's type 2, the lesion occurs inside the canal, but it, in, it only involves the deep branch, thus hand cutaneous sensation is normal and the palmaris brevis is also normal. We have already talked about Guyon type 2a in a prior answer. Just remember that this syndrome is probably better known as the syndrome of the tendinous arch of the hypothenar muscle. This syndrome being true to the dictum that the entrapment of a nerve by a muscle never affects the entrap entrapping muscle does not affect the hypothenar muscles. That is because the deep branch is entrapped after the exit of the fibers that go towards the hypothenar muscles. In Guyon type 3, only the superficial branch of the ulnar nerve is involved. Therefore, only the cutaneous abnormality of the distal palm and fingers associated with this branch and the palmaris brevis will be affected. In this frame, we're looking 
at the basic lesions in all the Guillain syndromes. In type 1, both the deep and the superficial distal branches of the ulnar nerve are affected. In type 2 and type 2A, only the deep branch is affected. In type 2A, the deep branch is affected only after the fibers for the hypothenar muscles have departed, hence the hypothenar muscles, including the abductor deity minini, are spared. Whereas in type 2, the lesion occurs prior to the departure of the hypothenar branches, hence the hypothenar muscles are involved. In Guyon's type 3, only the superficial branch is affected. As far as the first dorsal interosseus being affected only in Guyon type 3, when only the superficial branch is affected, this muscle, that is, the first dorsal interosseus, is spared. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. The first dorsal interosseus will be involved in the syndrome of the tendinous arch of the adductor pollicis muscle, A true, B false. In the syndrome of the tendinous arch of the adductor pollicis muscle, the entrapment occurs at the tendon of the adductor pollicis muscle, which is the last muscle innervated from the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. Only the adductor pollicis brevis is affected. As you can see, there are exceptions for every rule, and this is the exception, or at least one of the exceptions to the rule, that no muscle entrapping a nerve hurts itself. This figure depicts all the distal ulnar nerve compression syndromes. Take a few seconds to see the relation between the entrapment and the anatomical structures. The first dorsal interosseus will be affected in Guyon's type 1, type 2, and type 2A. It will not be affected in Guyon type 3, nor it will be affected in the syndrome of the tendinous arch of the adductor pollicis muscle. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. Which of the following muscle is innervated by the ulnar and the median nerve? A. Flexor deity quinti. C. Adductor pollicis. C. Flexor pollicis brevis. D. Flexor digitorum superficialis. At least in most of the general population, the muscles innervated by one nerve is regularly not innervated by another. But in the hand, the flexor pollicis brevis is an exception. This muscle has a superficial and a deep part, which I have represented here. The superficial part is innervated by the median nerve and the deep part by the ulnar nerve. The flexor pollicis brevis originate from the flexor retinaculum, the trapezium, and from the trapezoid and the capitate. It inserts at the base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb on the ulnar side. Its action is to flex the proximal phalanx of the thumb at the metacarpal pharyngeal joint. This figure illustrates the way to test it. So the answer to this question is C. Thank you very much for your attention.